Hello everyone. Uh, I hope all of you are doing great and staying safe. Uh, I'm Yashasri and I head customer marketing at Freshworks. Uh, first of all, I welcome you all to the Freshworks for Startups Against All Odds Startup Summit and to this session, uh, which is titled as Running a Marathon and Sprinting at Times. It is an absolute honor for me to be introducing to all of you our speaker for this session, Vinita Singh, CEO of Sugar Cosmetics. Vinita founded Sugar Cosmetics in 2012 at a time when the market was dominated by brands such as Lakme, L'Oreal and MAC Cosmetics. Uh, but very soon Sugar Cosmetics rose to be one of India's fastest go growing uh, premium beauty brands uh, with a distribution network of over 1700 retail outlets in more than 100 cities and not to forget over 100 crores in revenue. Vinita is a TEDx speaker and an alumnus of IIT Madras and IIM Ahmedabad. She is also a triathlete and an ultra marathoner. Vinita will now share with us her inspirational story of how she got all this done against all odds. So thank you for joining us today, Vinita, and over to you. Hi, Yasashri. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. I cannot see you, but hi to everybody who's out there. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Yep. Yes, Ashri, can you confirm that you can see? Yes. Okay, great. Right. So um, thank you so much. It was actually a very generous introduction. And um, well, yeah, it does sound like a very fancy story. I went to IIT Madras and then went to MIM the Bad. I had an investment banking job offer um, while I was graduating from IMM the Bad. Uh, which I decided to not take up at the age of 23. This was back in 2007 and decided to start uh, my own company. And um, well, yeah, that's the uh, sugar cosmetics finally turned out in FY20 to have 100 crore, 105 crores in net revenue. Um, we have more than 3 lakh uh, direct customers who we directly address through our D2C channels, more than 1700 retail outlets. And um, of course, it's been like a dream journey. So the fact that the title of this summit is against all odds, I think the only thing odd that is, is, you know, me speaking at this event, because clearly this has been such a dream journey, right? Like uh, going, you know, starting up and then going on to build a hundred crore company in five years. Well, that was really what the plan is. Uh, but well, the true story is actually it's taken way longer and it's been a way harder journey. And uh, well, it actually, you know, for the first 10 years of creating uh, my own business, I wasn't able to even break the 10 crore revenue barrier. And uh, so when you look at the real story behind all the <clears throat> fancy introductions and the PR plugs, then it's very clearly this, the, the blue circle is the part that I always talk about because that's the part that's really fun and exciting and there's 2x, 3x year on your growth. But the part that is behind that is those 10 years of staying under 10 crores of revenue and the long struggle that actually led to that. So. As it turns out, <clears throat> the real story is that um, when I was 23, I decided to uh, not take up this Deutsche Bank job offer because I really wanted to create a company that could solve the problem for um, women because I really thought that young millennium customers wanted a lot out of their brands. And <clears throat> there were very few brands that were able to provide that. And I wanted to start a women's lingerie brand. Um, when I decided to actually take the plunge, um, went to a few, maybe four or five VCs to actually raise a very small amount of money, one crore from VC funds. Um, of course, had a lot of rejections uh, because at you know 23 year old, uh, why would she be in a position to start her own brand? And um, you know, as like immature kids do when like you have your first breakup and then you're like oh i'm never ever gonna see a boy in my life again the same way i swung from like having those four or five vc rejections to saying i'm never gonna raise any money i'm gonna build a bootstrap business and try to like be a cash flow positive company and build everything from scratch on my own without having to depend on investors and so after having given up uh my investment banking job offer i decided to start building a company but it was so hard back then without any money so i actually ended up starting a services company and it was something that i definitely wasn't passionate about but that was the only thing i could figure out that would not require any sort of 
fund raising and it really didn't go too far um in finally after 4 5 years of staying in the 2 3 crore net revenue and you know profitable but really not having anything exciting to build zone i thought that it was time to get back to what i was really passionate about which was to build a company for uh, women consumers and uh, that's when beauty as a category was really picking up uh, you know women were beginning to use makeup on a regular basis they were more interested in what they were putting on your skin and so in 2012 along with my husband koshik uh, we started this company called fab bag now fab bag the idea was of course it was doing a lot of things because at that time we wanted to differentiate by offering like an e-commerce business which could give a subscription so we used some ai and you know an algorithm to put together like what were the best products that would suit a particular consumer and have like a curated set of products that would go out to every single uh, consumer who had signed on with us so as you can see like the gray line that's actually the vanity metrics that's the direct consumers that we had and you know year on year we are really growing those consumers but we were seeing that there was a lot of um, we were losing a lot of consumers as well so the idea was that every month they would get like four to five products that were curated based on their skin type their makeup preferences and products that would work for them and as we started growing the subscription model we realized in the first two to three years that uh, you know it was really hard to scale that because with every additional consumer it was tougher and tougher to explain to them how subscription really works and you know add to that like the supply side complexity and we very soon came to a situation where the whole cac you know um, cac and uh, aov model was such that we weren't breaking even per order and we didn't have the kind of money to invest in like really growing Uh, through a uh, uh, you know inorganic uh, growth channel that wasn't making money so we at that time started thinking about okay what do we do next right because uh, and you know the interesting thing was that every month we would send out these beauty products to these customers and we'd get like a ton of feedback like you know what they wanted in their makeup their skin care and the most consistent feedback that we kept getting was that uh, women really wanted um you know makeup products that could last them really long because they were like i stay in a place where there's humid weather i work you know travel through local transport and which is why like the whole pollution by the time i reach office my makeup just comes off so we started seeing that there was this need for um makeup that was really 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 long lasting and uh, so we went back to our brands and you know we tell, told them and and these were you know our consumers were all these young millennials who really wanted products that were long lasting so we went back to the brands and told them that you know this is we figured out how you can really address the millennials you know create these really match really long lasting products and we've also worked with them to figure out what kind of formula would work best we figured out that a liquid lipstick that dried into a complete matte format would last like all day from 9 am to 9 pm and that's really going to solve the problem for these young millennial women uh, but most brands were like listen you know our customers are millennial as well as the millennials mom so you know i really can't have a product that's so mad plus if i put a liquid in a bottle the consumer is going to expect it to be a gloss you know the whole trend of a liquid be actually mad is going to be shocking and you know we might have a lot of consumer dissonance and so they didn't want to do this and so we kept seeing this opportunity where there were all these millennial women they wanted something and you know the traditional brands were offering something else and there was this white space and so we went to our board and we said like you know we want to do this we really want to build our brand and um you know every single time this conversation came up uh, the response was always like ha huh, but in india to make a brand you need at least 50 crore how much do you have uh, we had like a few lakhs right so every time we would have this conversation where like we see this opportunity we, we have the supply chain we know that there is a white space but it takes 50 crores to build a brand and you know we have like just a few lakhs so as months by uh, went by those you know few lakhs started dwindling further and then suddenly you reach like this edge of the cliff where you're like you know there is we you know there is no future over here because we can't spend in marketing to grow that bag because that's really not scaling subscription is not working for our consumer base and um, there is this big opportunity so you know leap of faith let's just do it and we launched sugar cosmetics in 2015 now as we launched sugar cosmetics uh, it was of course we started with like two products because you know at the end of the day uh, if we like i mentioned we had very few um, very we had very little money left so we immediately stopped the tap on all the marketing that we were doing on fab bag put every single penny into sugar and uh, with these two products we launched and the feedback was amazing like right? you know the product did incredibly well and but the real the real big launch that we wanted to do was lipsticks right and 
So, and we'd created this formula with the manufacturer. The products were there ready in Germany, but we ran out of money. So back in 2000, um, you know, we were back in 2015 where we completely ran out of money and we have this successful product. We want to scale it further. We really believe in it, but you know, because of money, we can't import it. And there are suppliers calling us saying that, you know, we can't keep the stock for so long. You just have to pick it up. We manufacture it for you, pay the money, pick it up. And um, so that's when we did something that we'd never done before. Started, re- you know, getting money from friends and family. Asked my mom for money for the first time, and uh, you know, some debt came through that. Finally, our angel investor, who's really been an angel through this whole journey, uh, realized that okay, there is potential, but you know, there is no business sense for me to invest any money in this. But what I can do is that you know, I have this one crore of money, which is our own carry money. That's uh, you know there, which I can give it to you at a very very low interest rate. And you know, the only thing he said was that this money is very precious, so you just cannot lose it. Whatever happens, you cannot lose this money. You need to return this money. This is debt money. And you know, we really took that money as like you know, like this is our lifeboat, and really we're gonna take this one crore of debt that we have and make this. You know, business really scale and make it worth the, uh, you know, the conviction that our investor had really shown us. And well, that's what happened. Like, you know, the moment we launched the lipsticks, they became viral on Instagram. Women were sharing because, you know, the colors were so unique. There were so many years of like real hard work and, you know, customer insight and data that had gone into like building those products. And, you know, they worked really well. So they were super hit on Nika. They were doing really well on our own channel. And yes, so eventually that whole journey of having these. You know, uh, you know that hundred crore revenue which we crossed last year, having seventeen hundred retail stores, having like these, you know, three hundred thousand direct customers was buying from SugarCosmetics.com or the app which we launched last year, did happen. And you know, the f- interesting thing is that after we actually launched and the product did become like a hit, Sugar started doing really well. We did manage to raise the money, and we actually ended up in the next two years raising ninety crores in equity, another ten crore in debt. So about hundred crore, which was double of what we always kept thinking that you know we don't we can't start a brand because we don't have the fifty crore. And you know when things started happening, when the brand started really doing well, uh, we did manage to raise like a double of that. So, and you know, so what this story is actually something that I. Uh, you know, reminded me of my own experience in ultra marathons. And since Yashashri mentioned this thing about triathlons and ultra marathons, I really want to talk about this. So uh, there is an ultra marathon, which is known as the world's toughest ultra marathon called Comrades. It's this 89 kilometer stretch between Durban and Peter Maritzburg, where you have seven rolling hills and you have to traverse those 89 kilometers on foot. And the reason that this race is known as one of the toughest in the world is because it has a very strict cutoff of 12 hours. So you finish one second after the clock hits 12 hours, zero minutes, zero seconds, you actually don't get any medals. So there's a person who stands at the race at the 12 hour cutoff, looking away from the finish line, shooting his gun. And then the hundreds of runners that finish one second after the 12 hour cutoff, they, they don't get a medal. So you get this tag, which is called DNF, which is did not finish. Now, for anybody who's like a runner out here, that tag is very burdensome. Like, you know, did not DNF tag is what it's called. So I, you know, first signed up for this race in 2011. And uh, I, I just felt that I, I was not trained enough. So I ended up not boarding that day into South Africa. And um, then, you know, the next two years, I somehow got the courage, um, managed to go participate in the race in 2012 and 30 actually finished like three and a half minutes before the cutoff. It was like a really, really close finish before, you know, putting in more effort in training and then being able to shave off one hour and like actually get a bronze medal home in uh, 2014. From my experience, you know, when I look back at what I did in 2012, 13 versus 2011, the year that I had uh, not finished, I realized that, you know, the mileage that I had put in in training was similar. And then I started looking at the race reports and I realized that every year, Apart from the 4,000 odd people who did not finish, you know, who were the ones who would reach the finish line after the cutoff, there were another 6,000 who were DNS, did not start, you know, and those 6,000 were people like me because it was the most common reason for not showing up at the start line was feeling undertrained, you know, like drawing worst case scenarios, what happens if I'm not able to finish it and not showing up at the start line. 
and and there were these six thousand people, which is more than the number of people who actually ended up not finishing. You know, who had mentally decided that you know there is a chance that I will not be able to finish on time, and they just didn't show up at the start line. And that really hit me that you know showing up at the start line is really what the most important step is. That's what it boils down to. That's you know it really matters. And the same. insight i've had in this whole startup journey that the you know the showing up matters because you for you to be able to pivot you need to have first shown up in the first place and and you know lots of large companies have proven in our case as well the only reason like we could never have raised money to build a brand we could never have raised money um to we could never have thought that we could figure out the supply chain now we manufacture in seven countries how to crack that kind of supply chain without having that exposure that fabbank gave us which is the you know the the fact that we showed up got us the opportunity to really pivot and second was being at the right place at the right time so you know all these companies we talk about who benefited a lot from covid you know from zoom to big basket but you know they've been building their business for years and for us as well like in 2015 if somebody said that d to c was you know which is direct to consumer like was a space where you know large funds in india would have like a like a vertical where they would say that you know we're really interested in d to c and we're going to bet business is there um it would have been hilarious because in 2015 there was no d2c you know people did not talk about building d2c brand that was just like trying to create a consumer brand which was considered a traditional business now when that changed in the last 2 3 years suddenly sugar became hot because you know d2c was like a trend and everybody wanted to invest in companies that were in the d2c space but really you know like when we started it was just like you know trying to build a brand and not you know having any idea that there would be eventually a potential right similarly like the whole power of like compounding i you know have learned it in the like seeing the last 5 years that you do like the 2x 3x that you grow every year starts mattering but you know for that you have to have put in those years at the under 10 crore revenue where you're just slowly building in the skill set you're building in your network and you know that showing up consistently does matter So that's that's the first story that I wanted to share you. The second story that I want to share you uh, with you is about COVID, uh, because uh, you know I think one of the biggest things that COVID did was, uh, and you know why the all the webinars and all started was because of the fact that you know people really panicked. It was something that was the first in a, a hundred years kind of an event, and you know the reaction was full of like. uh you know that whole going out of our comfort zone and not knowing what this animal really is and uh, that's exactly what happened to us as well so pre covid like in february we were a company which had just closed about 100 and you know we were looking at about 105 to 110 crore net revenue and you know we'd worked on this plan for next year being like 2x of that so 200 crore cross karna hai and uh, you know we because we were a brand with high gross margin we wanted to invest in branding so we already started doing in you know first jan feb march of the year we start doing these mass same atl campaigns and the idea was to be, be do like solid atl over the year uh, so that we would be in the position to actually hit that 200 crore through our you know large retail network apart from of course uh, direct to consumer and online now as covid hit and of course you know all the plans went out the window and the first couple of months was like this whole a lot of companies experienced that zero revenue right my co-founder used to joke that we always thought that okay one day we're going to hit like lakme's revenue well that happened in april of this year lakme was also at zero revenue probably and we were also at zero revenue and um, so it wasn't in a good way and that's when we started um, really you know so obviously the whole standard cost cutting etc started but what we figured at that time was that in a crisis we needed you know we had like these 1000 people who were in retail you know we had like this whole team which was now not getting to be in the same room and we you know wanted to give them all like a shared mission you know like a and and in a crisis we thought that that was the most empowering feeling like to convert that fear of the unknown that you know fear to like a mission and so what we did is we did this town hall in april um first week of april where we said that you know april we don't know may we don't know in june uh, you know we know that we want to break even we want to get back put a target for ourselves as a company we are going to do 5 crores in net revenue in june and uh, you know that's going to help us break even and that's probably still 40% of you know what we were doing pre covid but it's still like a goal that the whole team can get together 
and that's really what happened right in the next couple of months like all our retail staff they started calling up customers to do these direct to customer orders so you know a customer who would buy us at shopper stop she'd get called and you know she we would like ship the product directly to her and all these uh, sales girls and boys they became like these uh, beauty assistants who were helping out consumers on the phone um the website number started like really doubling and tripling through me and june and uh, you know obviously there was a shortage of uh, manpower uh, you know in our warehouses etc but we started filling up in cars and you know delivering these uh, uh, boxes to consumers so a lot of action started happening there right and um, you know instead of five we actually ended up doing six and that was that was like a super learning for the team and it again uh, you know the story that i wanted to share related to that was about uh, the iron man so iron man is this like triathlon that happens where you do a 3.8 km swim followed by a 180 km bike followed by a 42 km run um, over a period of 17 hours now um, so 3 years back uh, my husband and i we signed up for the iron man and you know it was his idea I, like you know i he i was a runner but i couldn't swim and i couldn't bike and he was a swimmer so i think he thought that this was the best way to you know, take revenge for i don't know the lucky ki sabzi that he had been giving him or whatever um and so we signed up for this race and the you know biggest challenge is that all of the time like fear was always about fear of failure like the fear that i was dealing with right and suddenly when you're talking about a swim in an open water like in a lake or a sea you're talking about very real fear right fear of death fear of deep water and i've always growing grown up being a non swimmer so i did try learning some swim but it was like this cross between freestyle and breaststroke where there's like a lot of movement but very little displacement and you can't really call it swimming and then i ended up as a kid having like this story analogy so which made me like exit that whole water scene and i you know just stayed away from water so the biggest thing was that in the iron man the first cut off is the swim cut off which is like 2 hours 10 minutes and you have to do the swim cut off and it's going to be in a lake so 12 months before the real event uh, which we did in austria in 2017 um signed up for this open water event in california and there was this lake in which uh, it was just a 1 and 1/2 km swim and um, this is me at the exit of the swim because it took me like 1 hour 10 minutes and I was actually the absolute last person to get out of the water and when i got out of the water this is what i looked like because at every like 2 minutes i would put my head under the water my heart rate would you know cross 200 beats per minute because i couldn't see the base right like in a pool you're so used to seeing the base when you don't see the base you really panic and then i would go to a kayak and then you know the rescue team would come and they'd be like you want to quit you want to quit and i'd be like no let me try some more and it was this like you know went on and on like this and came out really looking like that and the last person out of the water so over the next 12 months spent a lot of time swimming in you know what we could call like the cleanest water in the world like the mumbai shore so we'd go in a fisherman's boat like just jump into the water and the same thing every time you know putting the head under water panicking like really you know a heart rate beating and singing that song what doesn't kill you make you stronger under the water just trying to get to the next point and always always the you know last person coming out of the water and well you know with a lot of these swims what happened was that you know every single time i would have this feeling that yes it was one more small win against what i always considered to be my greatest fear which was the fear of death and deep water so this was the yeah, the uh, i man finish again almost the last person of out of the water but um, 19 minutes before cut off and very happy that you know i had really had a little win again again you know that that fear that i would do is considered to be my greatest and then of course the bike you know and the run happened and managed to finish the ironman in 16 hours it was absolutely impossible and crazy journey and what that taught me was that you know when you have like this you know when you do something new there is like this big hormonal rush that you have which is the, there's cortisol and there's adrenaline so the stress hormone and the you know excitement hormone and you know the you know what scientists say is that like the rush that you feel the chemical release is actually the same for both so basically when you experience something new what you the name that you give it really matters so every time you try to convert your fear to fuel and you call it excitement you get that propulsion where you feel like this rush and you want to do more whereas you know when you call it fear it really like leads to inaction and you slow down and you become like inert right and so that's what we did at after covid we were like we will not let this make us inert and inactive we will help this propel us we will help this make us stronger take the bull by its horn 
and it really helps and of course as a company you know there are things that we we take a lot of risks like we take a lot of risks in new products categories and you know even with people but there are some things that we protect at all costs so those are the categories where we take zero risk you know like brand gross margin like it's a fundamentally has to be a very healthy gross margin business so we won't go into categories like sanitizer even though, though they are attractive because the margins are lower you know the cash flow is important culture so these are the things that we really hang hang on to for dear life and you know the the others are the things that we actually take risks on so uh, and you know we actually celebrate all of failures at town hall so our business is very uh, insight driven uh, so we you know there are many things times that we've gone wrong with our insights and i can give you an example in q and if you're interested and we celebrate those at our, our town halls and lastly you know the fundraising bit so we we as a company we've always thought that we suck at fundraising we address a market which for women vcs don't understand we are a husband wife team so you know we seized don't think of it as cool two guys is always the coolest combination so uh, we've really been really bad but what we realized is that you know there's a way too much disproportionate pr that's given in the main media to fundraising and once you like focus on your business like and you know only some businesses which have like really really large market size are able to raise that kind of every six months sort of thing so if you focus on just building fundamentals and your metrics the fundraising will always come so that's the other um, realization that we had So yeah, I just want to end with saying that have had like a lot of odds, and I think you know now I've started embracing the odds. And as a company, we embrace the odds. We can we tell ourselves that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and gives a lot of content for such events. And um, that's what we are looking forward to in this post-COVID world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vinita. I think a big applause from me, and I'm sure you see the chats where you know people are uh, very very inspired. I think. Uh, I mean, two big things, you know, personally for me, and I'm sure from all of us here who's attending the event as well. I think one showing up matters. I think so well explained, and uh, definitely, I think using fear is fuel. So I think these are two things that uh, you know, definitely me and a lot of other, uh, you know, especially budding entrepreneurs who've been waiting on an idea or who've been thinking about how to, you know, get that start. I think that's going to be really useful for them. Thank you for such an inspiring session. Thank you. Think, uh, you're seeing all the comments there, and I think. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not able to see the comments, but yeah, I'll I'll take the download from you. I I read out some. It was freaking awesome. Everybody, okay. they love the way you're. I mean, obviously, it's your own story, so it's so well presented and so honest and genuine coming from you. I think a couple of questions. One in terms of, uh, you know, while you took this plunge and you started everything, how did you probably go about? hiring your initial team and how did you think about uh, you know the initial set of scale that you spoke about because i think that's something that entrepreneurs can really uh, learn from your journey in terms of yeah. you know maybe identifying your uh, team or how do you go about scaling things so i think what's worked really well for us is that the first you know tell you to tell you are in the like the 10 20 crore sort of a net revenue rate which uh, i think you know unless you've like really something explosive happens a lot of us spend the first 2 3 years because we're just getting product market fit and you know we're figuring out distribution and stuff so in that time what you really need in your team is like a bunch of like multitasking passionate go getters so we always have this skill and will sort of an uh, evaluation that we do um you know I, in the beginning we only hire for high will and high iq so we actually uh, you know do this iq test which um, might sound a bit contrived but the idea really behind it is that you get a smart person who's really passionate about the space and most of our uh, team members in the initial years were actually women who were trying to solve the same problem them as us and um, you know they they are able to figure out like if retail doesn't work they switch to e-commerce and you know they can do a lot of things and that really helps up to a certain stage once you cross that stage then you need to start hiring like specialists people who are way better than you and and experienced so like for instance for us in retail like our, all our regional sales managers are people who come in with that 10 to 15 years experience and networks they know distributors and that's really really helped um it scale beyond that you know first 20 30 crore sort of a net revenue to like 100 and hopefully you know i don't know how many times it'll change like okay, in the 200 300 range because we've never got there yet but yeah that that's how we look at it uh, we've looked at it so far great great no that's uh, that's super helpful thanks for that and i think we have a couple of questions uh, i think how did you manage to start with just 1 crore so i think where did you put in that initial 1 crore 
Yeah, so this is, um, you know, that one crore was actually debt, uh, which we had taken after uh, we ran out of money that we, you know, in the process of growing fab bag, um, we just put it in inventory. So we knew that, you know, this money is very precious. This is debt. Like you look at debt very different from what you look at equity. Equity is something that you can invest in marketing. You can invest in team building. But when you have debt, you know that, you know, there is a clock ticking, right? So we only invested that in, you know, the product, like just getting the inventory in and managing our working capital. Everything else we actually grew organically. So we figured out like influencers. So using social media. So, you know, in the whole COVID time, we've seen social media has like been a superb channel for us, right? We've grown an Instagram from three and a half lakh in March to uh, six and a half lakh in July. That's because of the fact that you know the engagement is really high. It's a category where women love sharing the makeup look that they're wearing, and so we use all of those uh, like really organic channels to scale. And of course, partners like Nike, Amazon, rather than actually investing anything in marketing in those initial years, because one crore is really a small amount. When we finally raised that, you know, the fifteen crore and the seventy-five crore, that that the you know eventual hundred crore that I spoke about, that's when we started really investing in marketing, brand building, and things like that. Great, great. No, it was an absolute pleasure listening to you, and uh, more power to you for the boss lady that you are. So thank you so much for taking time out and being part of this uh, summit. We we really from the bottom of our hearts. I think we're all inspired and uh, more power to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Yasri. It's super fun. Thank you.